sing, Would you be free? Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Come on, church, sing with me. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Sing, would you be free? Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. There is power, power. Wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. Precious blood of the Lamb. And would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, there is power, power, wonder working power. Of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Last verse, and would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood, and would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. All right, church. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Hey. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting
rested peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arm. We are leaning, come on, church, leaning, safe and secure. a great promise that we can lean on him for everything in life. Amen. Is our living hope. You believe that this morning? Let's sing this together. We'll sing how great the chasm. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. Desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through, then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross, the cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior. I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. We'll sing hallelujah. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living home. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has brought the victory. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Come on, church, say it again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave 
has no claim on me. It's Jesus, yours is the victory. Oh, it's hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, it's hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Every voice. Hallelujah. Praise God. Church, hallelujah. Death has lost. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my Amen, amen. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, to Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. Uh, hopefully, we're far enough into uh, the, this series, if you've been here anyway with us, that you're still not having to go uh, table of contents to get it found. But if you are, then go to the table of contents, find it, and uh, make your way uh, over there. We'll be there uh, just shortly, you know, there's a saying that says that if th those things that you work the hardest for, you enjoy the most. You know, your parents ever teach you that? That, it, it, you know, if you work hard for something, you appreciate it more, you enjoy it more. And if that be the case, I must really be enjoying uh, these sermons in Ezra because Ezra has not been kind to me. Um, in my preparation. I've probably never struggled as much as I have walking through uh, this series just in not so much understanding Ezra. Ezra is not so uh, difficult to understand as it is to, what do I say to you about it? What do I bring here? And uh, I, I, uh, it's been fun. So today, similar to last week, we we're covering a lot of scripture. Now, before, let me explain before you kind of get nervous. I'm going to cover two full chapters today, okay? That does not mean, and you can praise the Lord, I'm going to deal with every verse. That's not it at all. Really, as a matter of fact, I'm going to zero in on about a verse and a half, okay? But I want to help you to understand what's going on in uh, both chapters, what takes place in chapter 7 is Ezra finally shows up on the scene. I read that this week, and I'm like, well, thanks for coming to the party, Ezra. Uh, we're seven chapters deep in this, and he just now uh, gets there in his own writing. 
And so he has been given orders by the king, King Artaxerxes, uh, to go back. And so what Ezra does, Ezra leads another group of, uh, of, of those from Israel uh, to come back, those that had been captive in Babylon, exiles is what I was trying to come up with, another group of exiles to come back and return into the land, some for some fact-finding and, and to see what's happening, others to come and join them. And so because here again, we're, we're, we've got so many verses to cover. I'm not going to read all of it, but I do have a list of verses that I want to read that's going to help kind of set the scene for where we're going uh, here in, in particular in chapter seven. I want you to listen to these. And what I want you to do is I want you to hear or listen to see if you hear a, a theme through here. Psalm 95, five, the sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Isaiah 48, 13. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. Psalm 95, four. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. Job 12, 10. In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Psalm 31, 15, my times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who would persecute me. Psalm 145, 16, open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. First Chronicles 29, 12, both riches and honor come from you and you reign over all in your hand is power and might in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all Nehemiah 1:10 now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand you say well it's all old testament okay a challenge accepted John 10:29 my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I like that one, don't you? Luke, one, I said, don't you, amen? Okay, Luke one sixty six. and all those who had heard them kept them in their hearts saying, what kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Acts eleven twenty one and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Psalm ninety eight one, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. Did you catch it? One word, what is it? Hand. All throughout the entirety of your Bible, from Genesis all the way through to the maps, we find the mighty hand of God at work. Yet often, we're kind of left of, what does that mean? The hand of God. What, what, is, it, what is this theme of why is it so important? We'll also find it's not just important, but it is of great consequence throughout your Bible. This is the theme, the hand of the Lord. You see the hand of God at work in creation. You see the hand of work uh, or hand of the Lord at work in giving of the law, the hand of the Lord at work uh, through the lives of the prophets. You see the hand of the Lord at work through the virgin birth uh, all the way through to the empty tomb. And we see his hand at work from the beginning of the church all the way until present day. It is often, not always, but often uh, seen with great similarities to the anointing of God or the favor of God. And the question I think that we want to ask today is, is there anything you and I can do to affect it? Can you and I affect the hand of God? Well, let me tell you this. Number one, you can't make God move his hand. We, we can't make God do anything. Please get this. He is a sovereign God. He does that which he wishes to do. I, I'll just say this. I don't want a God that I can manipulate. I don't. I, want, I need him to be bigger than me. 
I need him to be bigger than what, because I'm just telling you, I'd figure out a system if I could. And we, we you know, there, there's got to be a cheat code in it. And by the way, it's sometimes that's kind of what we're after, right? We don't necessarily want to put in the work, but, but it, you, you, you want a, a, a cheat code. Gamers, if you're a gamer in here, you, you get that, right? Um, it's like you don't want to go through all the levels to beat your game, but if I could have a cheat code, right, that, that could kind of cut the corner and help me to beat this big hairy monster, whatever he may be, right, then, then that'd be great. Listen to me. There is no cheat code that is to be found whenever it comes to dealing with the hand of God. So what we would say is this, Similar to what we experienced in Ezra 3 when we were talking about revival, I believe we also see in Ezra 7 that what we can do, however, is position ourselves to be a candidate to experience the hand of God at work in our life. I, help me. Come on. Amen? Is your, is your amen or bro? You're, you're, this is going to be a long day. Come on, stand up. Come on. Y'all, come on. Y'all think, well, he's just fun and amen. No, come on. Amen, stand up. See, you done went to sleep on me, all right? <clears throat> all right. <laughs> Half of you mad, I can tell. Amen. <laughs> you better say amen then, amen. All right? On, on the count of three, I need the best one you got, okay? I just want to make sure you still got one in you. You ready? This is amen, all right? You can give a Baptist amen, Pentecostal amen, Church of God amen, however you want, just give one, all right? One, two, three. Amen. That's decent. Let's let's do hallelujah. That's gonna stretch some of you, all right? On the count of three, I want the best one. You ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah. That was was pretty good, all right? Now, here I'm I'm gonna mess with some of you, all right? Because I may need some encouragement here a little bit. I need a, come on now. You, you okay? You ready? My college students do this with me on Wednesday nights. I'm getting them right where I want them, all right? I want, on, on three, I want, come on now. One, two, three. Come on now. Y'all sit down and stay with me. Come on now, take your seats. There you go, amen, come on. First amen that they've said today, and it was to sit down. I do think we can learn something in the life of Ezra that should be an encouragement to us in in how to go about positioning ourselves to experience God's hand. Because let me let me just say this: I I personally have experienced what it is to do what I do. At times when I knew, not just believe, but I knew the hand of God was upon me. I, I know what that is. I, I know what it is to experience his favor, his anointing, and, and, and see that at work. I know what it is to, to watch uh, somebody walking in the spirit in such a way that you can just see the hand of God at work on their life. There's evidence, by the way, of that. Please hear that. There's evidence of that. You don't have to wonder. I just don't know if God's with them. No, no, you can. Why? You can track it by the evidence in their life, the fruit that's coming out of it. You can see that at work. But I also will give witness to the fact that I know what it is to operate in the flesh. You ain't saying amen now, are you? I know what it is to operate and go through the mechanics and something fall flat and dead and wonder, man, what would we do wrong? What would, well, it wasn't about the mechanics of that. It may have been about the fact that I hadn't positioned myself in such a way that God could use me in that moment. Now, I don't know why y'all looking at me and judging like, well, we don't know about that part. I think we all probably do if we get honest. Amen? And understand what it is to, to walk in a way that's self-serving and self-promoting. Please, please hear this. When God says he's a jealous God, that doesn't mean that he's saying you can't worship Muhammad and Jesus at the same time. Yes, I, I believe that's part of it, but you also can't worship you and Jesus at the same time. 
You also can't promote you and Jesus at the same time. Please hear me. He is a jealous God that we would give our lives to the propagation of his glory, his word, his gospel, and his salvation. You and I don't have anything else to offer. So in Ezra um, chapter 7, this work has begun, and I want to read. Let's just, let's just start in verse 1, and I'll read down through verse 10. I told you we're going to really only look at a, a verse and a half. But this will just kind of catch you up into the, into the book. Chapter 7, verse 1, if you found it, say, uh-huh. The Bible says, now after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of uh, Persia, Ezra, the son of uh, Sarahiah, and the son of Azariah, and the son of Hilkiah, and the why, why did we read this? The, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the, the son of uh, Hittub, and the son of Amariah, the son of uh, Azariah, the son of uh, Marioth, the son of <laughs> the son of Zeriah, and the son of Uzi. Come on now for Uzi, Amen. <laughs> amen. That's the best word I've read in there. The son of Uzi, Amen. Who wouldn't like to have a friend named Uzi? Anybody seen Uzi? Where is he? Hey. I don't know. He, anyway, sorry. The son of Bucky. The, <laughs> this, I know some of you are mad. They're having fun in church. How dare we smile. Um, the son of Abishua, Abishua. The son of Phineas, I know that name. The son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron and the chief priest. Then this Ezra came up from Babylon. And he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his requests according to the, you see it? The hand of the Lord his God upon him. Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim, um, came up from Jerusalem in the, in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. How long was he on the journey? This is a math quiz. Four months. All right. That's a, by the way, you take off walking and it takes you four months to get there. Amen. That's a long. Amen. I know some of you are like, well, they were used to it. Nobody's used to that. Amen. Okay. Now here's where it's, it, it's fitting to get good. He came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So he's declaring here as he does, by the way, also many other times throughout uh, even these two chapters that the good hand of the Lord was upon Ezra. But I found the, the language of some of this to be quite interesting. It said that the good hand of the Lord was upon him for Ezra had prepared, had prepared. What does that mean? That means that's past tense. So it's telling us that here before this good hand of the Lord was upon him, Ezra had done some stuff. Ezra had what? He had positioned himself to be under the hand of God. Why is this important? Here, here's why. God's not going to bless sin. God's, amen, right? God's not going to bless disobedience. And so please hear that if we are walking at this guilty distance from God, if we are continually refusing to follow, to trust and obey, please, please don't miss this. You are not placing yourself in a position to experience the hand or the favor, the anointing even of God. So let me give you these, and, and I, th I think there'd be an encouragement to you that 
Ezra did in this one verse that positioned himself. Number one, notice Ezra's purpose uh, here in the text. His purpose was that he had prepared his heart. Ezra had prepared his heart. He understood that even though he was sent on this mission to Jerusalem under the word and the protection of King Artaxerxes, his ultimate mission and purpose in life was not to please uh, that king, but it was to honor and please the God of heaven to, to live his life so that Yahweh would be glorified. He understood what it took to experience the hand of God at work in his life, and his purpose was to position himself in a way that God could use him. Here's my heart. I want to be used by God. Amen? I don't know about you. I want to be used by God. Why? Because I know what it is to, to live life to where nobody's being affected in a good way by my life. I, I'm aware that there will be a day I stand before God Almighty. And why? Because the Bible says so. It says, it's appointed unto man wants to die, and after that is the judgment. I'll give an account for how I've lived my life. By the way, so will you. I said, by the way, so will you. We're going to give an account for that. Well, what does that mean, preacher? That means you'll give an account for it. That means he'll look at your life and we stand up and say, here's what I, I did with life. This is, this is a picture of my life. And we're going to be, if you're a Christian, we'll be rewarded for that which we've done good. That which we have wasted is just going to be burned up. And if I'm a non-believer, I'll give an account for every sin I've ever committed. The Bible says I would be then forever separated from a holy God, cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Well, I, you, and you may be like this. Uh, well, I know I'm not going there. Amen, I'm saved. Well, great. How much of life's just gonna be wasted and burn up? I mean, think about that because if, if you're saved in here this morning and, and, and all life is just really about you, can I just tell you, you're wasting life. We have one opportunity to live life. And here's what I'm declaring. I want to be used by God in this life. I don't get round two. I'm not coming back as a butterfly. What's that called where they, you come? Yeah, I don't want round two. Well, by the way, it doesn't matter what I want. You don't get one. We get one shot at this. He gives us one opportunity in which to live this life. And that, that means, mom and dad, you get one opportunity to point your children towards God. Grandparents, you get one opportunity, one lifetime to, to point your grandbabies towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to all of us. We have one opportunity to live life in a way that our friends and neighbors and classmates and coworkers could understand that there is a God in heaven who loves him, loves him so much he would send his only son to a cross to die to pave a way for them to come to know him. One shot at it. Ezra understood his purpose was to, was to live for the God of heaven. Joshua was a good example of this. Joshua 24, 15 says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. He's talking to a group of people that's like, I, we just don't know if we're really all that in with, with Yahweh right now. And he's like, if you think it's evil to serve him, man, just go pick one. But I like how he follows it up. He said, whether it's the God of your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. He's saying, this is my pur I don't have another purpose here. My purpose isn't to build my kingdom. My purpose isn't to make a lot of money. My purpose isn't to get a lot of wealth or fame. My purpose isn't to, to, to live out all of my fantasies and have my dreams come true. My purpose is I'm gonna make much of Jesus for as long as there is breath in my lungs. God, I'm here for you. And what's interesting about these men, men like him, everybody else knew their purpose. What do you mean? Well, folks that watched Ezra, his life and, and heard his message, they weren't wondering, 
I wonder what Ezra's all worked up about. They knew why. They saw his life and they heard his message. Here's, here's the question you and I have to wrestle with this morning. Do those around you know your purpose? I mean, first, obviously, you need to answer the question, do you know your purpose? But because I, I, I'm guessing most of you call yourself Christians like, oh, amen, I do. Just, amen every day. Is there anybody else knows your purpose? Those that you work with? Would they be surprised to find out what you claim to be your purpose? His purpose positioned himself to experience the hand of God. Notice though further in the, in the same verse, his, Ezra's pursuit was, was what? To seek the law of the Lord. His pursuit was to seek the law of the Lord. The word seek here is, a, is an interesting Hebrew word that, that's called darash, darash. The word darash means to, to, to tread or to frequent, to tread or to frequent. It usually is to, to, to follow uh, with pursuit, to, to, to in specific, to, to ask at all care, to diligently inquire, to make inquisition, to inquire about, to investigate, to be intent, or to make supplication. This is what he is seeking. He is seeking, he is investigating with great intensity the law of the Lord. The Bible gives us a lot of help, by the way, in what we are to seek, even how we are to seek it. Uh, there was in Ezra day as well as there is in ours also a lot to seek in the culture. The culture tells us what we should seek, right? Matter of fact, if you are on the internet at all, uh, the internet tells you what to seek. Is that right? I mean, it, it, it does. You, you just browsing along in the internet, whether that's social media or on the, the Google or whatever. Um, isn't it interesting that the things that I was just talking about a little while ago, all of a sudden, there they are. Isn't it interesting about how, um, it's a little scary too, by the way, um, but if I happen to be in a certain place that certain things come up on my, on my phone or my laptop or my iPad, whatever, or if I happen to click on something that looks interesting uh, on there, then all of a sudden I must have super interest in it because now it's everywhere that I see on the internet. W what's happening? Culture is telling me what I need to be looking for. There's always been that which would pull at us to say, here's how you seek. But listen to how Ezra sought uh, out the Lord or sought the law of the Lord. In Ezra 8, chapter, or chapter 8, verse 21, he said, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and for our little ones and all our possessions. We proclaim to fast so that we might know the right way to seek after him. Amos also gives clear instructions. You remember the, uh, the, the man Amos, the prophet Amos, uh, about how we are to seek. Listen to Amos chapter five. It says, for thus says the Lord of the house of Israel, seek me and live. That's pretty plain. Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it with, with which no one will quench it in Bethel. Seek good and not evil that you may live, so the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken." Amos is quite clear, life is found in seeking the Lord. Life is not found on the internet. Now, I'm not being one of those, you get that internet out of your house, amen. That's not what I'm doing, okay? But I am here to tell you that that's not life. There, there, there's so many that are captivated by that, however, that their, their, their whole world depends upon whether or not people like, follow, 
or become friends with them on there. I've learned a new word recently. Y'all ready for this? Just say, "Uh uh-huh, come on. Influencer. Y'all heard that one? I like this one. That's a good one. Influencer. And, And do you know, it don't take much. It it just don't take much. People are getting famous for being famous. It's not about a skill set. It's not about a a, a life of dedication. It's not about uh, anything. They're just, they're just, hey, what they do? Oh, they're on the tech. Making videos. Influencer. This is, listen to me, it would, it would be humorous, and I laugh about it too. It'd be humorous if, if it wasn't so detrimental to our society. They've given their whole life to this, and now if I come in and I make a, a tick video, and you don't like it, love it, follow it, friend me for it, or let me influence you for it. How, what is my purpose? Now listen to me, please hear this. Our purpose comes back to, I want to be used by God. And the way that I I begin this is I want to seek with all that I am and all that I have, the law of the Lord. This is what Ezra is doing. He's saying with with everything in me, let me let me be used of God. And so while you're, to whoever I'm talking to, if you're watching me online, while you're out ticking, while you're out, um, what was the one? I talked about one Wednesday night with our college student. What's the one where you look in the middle distance and thank you, snap, snapping. So you're, you're <laughs> y'all know about that one too, don't you? See, okay. And I, so, cause there's so many of these. And, and so this one, this one's deep. How's it work? You just look confused. In the middle, look into the middle distance. Well, what does that say to them? We don't know. That's the beauty of it. Amen. Isn't that nice? And then it disappears. I'm not here to tear down what social media you're using, not here to even really discourage you from using it. But I sure want to influence you to say, don't waste your influence on trying to get people to like you more. Give your heart and your effort and your influence in seeing people come to love Jesus more. Let let me give you this this next one, and we're going we're gonna to be out of time. Ezra's practice, his purpose was to prepare his heart. His, his, his pursuit was to seek uh, the, the, the law of the Lord. Here's his practice. This is my guy. And to do it. To seek the law of the Lord and to do it. I'm so thankful this is included here in the text because it puts emphasis on the fact that he's not just on a fact-finding mission about Yahweh. He's not just trying to get more knowledge and put in his head why. Because all that does is just give us more pride and puffs us up. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up. But it's rather that he, he would use the entirety of his life, his knowledge, his, his everything he's learned about God and, the, and seeking the will of God to resign himself to simple obedience to the will that he has discovered about God. In other words, I don't want to just know, want to know what God wants of me. I want to know it and I want to do it. He, uh, <laughs> he did something in chapter eight that I found really interesting He put this at work. Let me me read to you chapter eight, verse 22. 
He said, uh, now he, let me back up, let me set this up. He's getting ready to go on the journey, and it's a perilous journey. This isn't like, hey, let's walk to, you know, Woodall. Okay. This is like, hey, let's, let's go walk around inner city Chicago. Okay, There's a, he's going through some rough neighborhoods. He's going through some rough places, uh, places that his life would be in danger. Now, I want you to listen to this. He's talking here to the king. He said, for I was ashamed to request, or talking about the king, to, to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road. Listen, why? Because we had spoken to the king saying, the hand of our God is upon us, uh, all for those uh, who for good for those who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against those that would forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. I just found that interesting. I read this. He's like, it'd be so cool if the king would send like, you know, his army to surround us as we go back. But he's like, I was way too embarrassed. Why are you embarrassed to ask? Well, I told him that God would protect us. Man, I wished I wouldn't have said that. You ever, you ever been there? You like, you, you like spoke up and like, man, God's going to take care of us. But then it comes time that you're supposed to be worrying. Any, am I talking to anybody this morning? Uh-huh. Hang on, sister. You posted this morning that God's got it all. Amen. Hang on. You, you posted this morning that he's got it all in his hands. You posted yesterday that you're just enjoying the peace of the Lord, but now all of a sudden, life's a mess and you're worrying. No, we could learn something from Ezra. I'd be too embarrassed to ask the king's help. Why? Because we had declared our faith was going to be an almighty God. So guess what we did? We didn't eat. We fasted and we sought the protection of the Lord. What happened? They experienced the protection of the Lord. That's what happened. God honors those who honor him. Please hear that. When we take time to position ourselves to experience him, he honors those who would trust him. Many in our day have become experts in the law, experts at memorizing, at quoting, and posting scriptures, but few resign themselves to a life of obeying the scriptures. Please get this and I'll move on and we'll close right here. I would much rather you obey a single verse than to quote to me a hundred of them that you have no intention of obeying. Number last, and we'll go eat a biscuit. Y'all hungry yet? I am every week. Ezra's proclamation. Y'all knew I couldn't preach a whole sermon without talking about soul winning, didn't you? He said it's to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. As always, as always, those who have purposed in their heart to love the Lord, to seek the Lord, to obey the Lord, please listen to me, will always, mark that word down, always find themselves telling others about the Lord. Let me say it again. Those who have purposed in their heart to love the Lord, to seek the Lord, to obey the Lord, will always, always, always find themselves telling others about the Lord. We simply can't follow Jesus with a buttoned up lip. Did you get the reference of that? You guys know how we used to, I don't think people do that anymore. Button up. Raise your hand if you've ever buttoned it up. Come on, raise your hand. Half of us, the rest of you all lying like, no, you ain't buttoned up. Okay, no, you would just like, mm, mm. Or you ever do the zipper? Lips are, some of y'all need to get rid of the zipper and the button. We can't follow him. He's like, oh, no, no, no. That's not how we're saved. I didn't say that's how we're saved. 
No, no, no. He said, come follow me and I will what? Make you fishers of men. This is, this is the way it's always been. It, this is not just in Jesus' teaching, which by the way, should be enough. You find this throughout the Old Testament. Those that want to obey the Lord want to make sure others would know and obey the Lord. You find it in David's writing, Psalm 40, verse eight. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord, you yourself know. He said, I have not hidden your word in, it just in my heart. I'm not constrained it here so that it would be hidden from others. Far too many of us buy the myth that, oh, they're, I'm not good with words. They're just going to have to watch my life. Please, ma'am or sir, don't, don't buy that lie. You're not living good enough. None of us are living good enough for folks to watch us and go, that, I need Jesus. That's why the command is given. Go into all of the world and preach the gospel. Here's my question and we'll have our prayer. Every person throughout our Bibles that experienced the hand of God, we see evidence of that in their life. Here's my question to you and it's a question I'm wrestling with all week. Is there any evidence that the hand of God's at work in your life? Any evidence? I think we need to ask these questions of ourselves, not just uh, admire, because I think we all do, right? We all admire Ezra. That's pretty cool what he did, amen? Isn't that, isn't that good? Can I just remind you, I, I'm, I'm not here preaching for the exchange of information. I'm preaching every single week to see transformation by the good news of the gospel. We gotta ask these questions, what's my purpose? What, 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 what am I pursuing with my life? What's, what's my practice? Am I, am I just talking about the will of the Lord? Am I, am I obeying it? What is my proclamation? What, am, am, is there anybody that's come to know Christ because I've told them about the gospel? Is there any evidence there? Here, here, here's, where, here's where I'm trying to get. There can be. There can be, I, I, I don't care. If you came in here today and would say, man, I have really messed life up. Great, that's what Jesus specializes in. Didn't you know that? He, he's not looking for good people. He's looking for obedient and willing people. He's looking for those that would just trust him. You don't bring your talent to him. You're not gonna impress God with your talent. One thing in the Bible that impresses God, faith. That's it. 